The Unshackled Waves, Episode 11. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode. Now, before we begin the show, I would just like to talk about some changes to the podcast that that have been made. First of all, we now have a lovely theme music for the show, which you should have, uh, should have um, just heard. So uh, that's a very, uh, makes us look more professional. And also soon we will also be recording a video version of the podcast. So you'll be able to see our lovely faces on uh, YouTube, most likely. And also the other change is that I will be uh, hosting the show solo now. Uh, Sukath is uh, stepping down as co-host as he wants to focus on producing more video content. So this means for the interview shows, it'll just be me interviewing the interviewing the guest. And for the review show, I will be joined by another contributor from The Unshackled to to discuss the the week's events. For this week's episode, my co-host will be Damien Ferry, who is a contributor to The Unshackled. So, Damien, welcome to the podcast. Hello, everyone, and it's lovely to be here. Yeah, we we haven't worked out a, a specific title uh, for you uh, on the site yet, but that's something that we we're definitely going to to fix very soon. That sounds great. Yep. So the first topic that we are going to discuss uh, this week, well, we're actually going to to talk about ourselves because uh, we were featured in an article uh, in the in the Age, and uh, which also appeared in other Fairfax uh, newspapers. Uh, it was titled "The The Keyboard Warriors of the the Alt Right." Yep, that's right. It was definitely um, one of those articles that raised uh, a few eyebrows and um, it was something to be very proud of and was very inspirational to be able to um, uh, be uh, a a contributee to a um, a left-wing newspaper. Yeah, but uh, because it was it was obviously an article supposed to smear us. I mean, uh, at the beginning, it it uh, it talked about uh, how of you know they contribute uh, we you know supposedly contribute to the the fake news epidemic, and also you know implied that we're you know all racist and and, and Nazis. So you know it, it it was supposed to smear us and and paint us in a negative light. But of course, of uh, all, all it did was. Was, was give us attention because our, our traffic and stats went through the roof that day. That's exactly right. I mean, we, we just soared over social media. And, I mean, um, we just have to um, go by the old saying that any publicity is good publicity, basically. I mean, Fairfax as a newspaper organisation, 26.4% share around Australia. I mean, these guys have a major influence, even in regional papers. I remember... I mean, I'm based in Wollongong in the Illawarra area in New South Wales, and even the Kiama Independent, small, tiny paper, and those guys even had the article in there. I mean, just quotes off the article, you just get the, the, the gist of what direction they were going with it in. I mean, this is a quote. It says, what followed was an exchange that perfectly captured the crowded and contested media landscape of the digital age, where sources of news can become perversely narrow and facts often matter far less than opinion. So basically it's already suggesting that what we produce in our content, that it's all rubbish, basically. And I mean, it even goes further to say, with the rise of Donald Trump in the US, a special significance has been attached to a nebulous collection of hyperventilating websites known as the alt-right that rallied around his candidacy and churning out the diet of attitude, fake stories and outright prejudice amplified by social media. So right there just explains just how biased that is and just basically what the mainstream media think of just regular folk like us that are trying to get our views out there and, and trying to produce content that mainstream media seems to carelessly not 
produce because there's so many issues that happen and we're thinking to ourselves, hold on, why didn't the news mention that today? Yeah, I mean, the, the mainstream media, they still don't get it. By by mentioning us and the, um, on the online version, they provided a hyperlink to the to the site as well, which was amazing. I mean, it only just makes mm-hmm. us stronger. I mean, it wasn't just our, our traffic that increased. It was also our Facebook likes and, and email uh, subscriptions. So, uh, so they 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 just still don't don't get that uh, you know they can criticize us all all they want but all they do is 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 bring attention to us i mean it reminds me of um during the the us election campaign when hillary clinton during a speech denouncing the alt right mentioned alex jones by name and and you know that that was the the best thing that uh, she could have done for alex jones and also when um steve bannon was hired uh, by the trump campaign she read out uh, breitbart headlines while well, they were uh, Milo Yiannopoulos' headlines and uh, once everybody heard those headlines they immediately googled them and looked up the articles so <laughs> yeah no that, that that's um I mean that just shows where where they're going with it I mean this is such a bias in the media it's shown in Fairfax it's shown in the ABC which continues to just produce um, this anti uh, right wing agenda and the, and the problem is this this is something that really um, is is a laugh. I mean, the alt right doesn't have a huge presence in the unshackled. I mean, it isn't a huge presence like it is in a lot of other media publications. We're basically um, based on uh, both conservative, libertarian, classical liberalism. Um, that's our approach. So we have a mix, a uh, range of broad uh, opinion um, that is centre right based, but. Um, we don't have a huge alt-right, um, uh, basically an alt-right um, gist to what we are producing. And I mean, um, not only that, but even if it was, I mean, it's just an attack on freedom of speech, of course, and trying to direct uh, people onto particular opinion and denouncing others. I mean, we had Richard Spencer um, he's the man behind the alt-right name. Um, he coined the term alt-right. And um, he was filmed at a conference and um, he was chanting, um, Hail Trump, um, for instance. And um, they were, you know, doing their, uh, um, you know, um, hands in the air kind of, you know, um, old school sort of fascist salutes. But the problem is, even though there is elements of that in the alt-right, it still doesn't give people um, the kind of base uh, where they can suggest that the alt-right is some sort of white supremacist organisation, which isn't what it is. I mean, um, they're definitely far right. There is no doubt about it. And the people in that group can definitely admit to it with pride. But they definitely aren't some sort of racist white you know, nationalist organisation because there's people of all colours, all genders, you know, in that group. And I mean, um, the only other thing that I have to say that can really be a laugh is what about the connections of the left-wing parties in this country? How about Labor's connection to communism, which is what happened with the split back in, you know, the old 50s and 60s with the DLP? I mean, they stem straight through, straight from communism. And, you know, you still have people like Lee Rhiannon from the Greens, just extreme politicians from the left that still, they're not even closet communists. They they provide so much policy. They provide so much outspoken opinion that basically shows who they are. The, the old watermelon kind of uh, analysation of being green on the outside and red on the inside, this is who they are. And they really aren't trying to hide it. And funny enough, the media don't touch on it. They do not touch on it and they do not criticise or condemn it at all. Yeah, I mean, when the the footage of uh, of this conference was released, I mean, uh, Trump had to immediately, uh, you know, disavow it, uh, you know, just uh, like he had to do during the campaign when um, or, uh, David Duke, or well, he didn't really endorse Trump, said that, 
you know, he just said you mm. should vote vote for Trump. But, uh, you know, they, they held up this conference and say, see, this is the, uh, this is an example of the alt-right. And of course, yeah, uh, as you said, the the left. I mean, nobody judges the entire left uh, based on the you know violence and language of the the socialist alternative when they cause mm. trouble at protests and smash up property. I mean, uh, Labor and the Greens they never asked to to disavow the uh, the socialist alternative on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. That, that's exactly right. I mean, what you've been seeing is an attack on democracy. I mean, with these protest movements. Um, there, there is no need because, I mean, protests should be kept um, where people use a protest on something that is authentic, something that that really there, there is a need for such an activity to produce. I mean, it is a freedom of expression, no doubt. But to protest a decision of a democratic election, I mean, this is communism 101. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, these people are in the streets, they're causing havoc, they're, you know, beating up Trump supporters, uh, people that don't agree with them, the tolerance, of course, that they preach. And, I mean, this this is who they are as people. And I don't remember when Obama won back in 2008 any conservatives on the street protesting or causing a havoc. I just don't remember it. I mean, this is just um, my way or the highway kind of approach, and it really is... Um, just showing who they are and hopefully in time people get to see this and get to learn it and um, I mean there's only so many things that the media can uh, disguise whereas um, now with social media the new media we now have a platform where we can prove to people what is really out there and people can get the other side of the opinion, the other side of the coin that isn't documented and that isn't reported. Yeah, I mean the the mainstream media, you know, you're not going to hear about all the all the violence against Trump supporters, but you will hear all the reports of fake hate crimes, which most of yeah. them have, have been debunked by now, but you know, they accuse yeah. us of uh, spreading fake news when 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 they basically they, they see a uh, so, uh, somebody says, oh, this happened to me, media automatically believes mm-hmm. it, yet when people actually fact check it, the police say, no, we never got a report on it. That, that's exactly right. I mean, this, this this is the funny thing. I mean, they use fake news to further their agenda, but then they perceive fake news as fake when it goes against them. I mean, I've seen on social media and just reports of people drawing swastikas, right? They draw swastikas and then they um, say something like, um, you know, um, get out immigrants or Mexicans and they put Trump on there and whatnot. If you look at the swastika, it isn't even done right. Now, if someone is a true Nazi, you think they'll be able to draw a swastika properly, but these people here aren't. They are just using it as an agenda. I see people that write notes, they write letters, and they're putting it on cars or underneath, you know, in letterboxes, and they say um, something like, um, make America great again, we don't want any gays or any, you know, Muslims in the neighbourhood to try and scare people, and then those people get the note, and then they put it on social media and say, oh, look what this Trump supporter did to me, you know, basically to... uh, create a victimization, a false victimization, because a lot of these people are writing the notes themselves and then putting it up just to cause a scene because they want chaos. It's, it, it's just the way that they express themselves, you know. They didn't get what they wanted, so now they are going to use any form they can to try and bring down um, a president, a country, no matter what. Even if it doesn't benefit the people at all, they will do what they can just to have their way. Uh, We are lucky that we do have the new media who's able to, uh, you know, fact check all of these uh, uh, stories that the the mainstream media puts out there. And, And obviously... They are concerned about that their their influence is declining and that uh, and and that people are turning to the new media. I mean, obviously, the the uh, the article in the the Age was obviously meant to sort of you know don't uh, these people you know they're all full of rubbish and you shouldn't uh, and you shouldn't. So they're they're definitely panicking the the main uh, the mainstream media that uh, uh, that they're now in now in decline and so all they've got left is just to throw these smears at at the at, 
at the new people. That's exactly right. I mean, we're seeing um, a revolution, um, and revolutions are normally um, seen as a left-wing cause. But I think it's it's a counter. It's a counter um, to what we have seen because what they have done is the left have pushed their cause so hard. So if they were smart, they could have done it in a slow pace. But over the last 50 years, we have seen such a dramatic change in society that basically it has caused people to erupt and say, you know what, this is just too far. This is pushing on my buttons. I can't take this. And that's why there is a counter-revolution of this of this sort. And that's why you're seeing Brexit, you're seeing Trump, you're seeing Pauline Hanson with her one nation over here in Australia performing really well. You saw the shooters, fishers and farmers take the seat of orange. That is something that is unheard of. I mean, people have been fed up with the mainstream parties. They see what's happening and they're starting to see these right wing parties as being a voice for the people because they aren't your traditional conservative or neocon party that uh, has always been uh, branded as being um, a supporter or um, of the rich or of the upper class. These people here um, are conservative, they're nationalistic, and they tend to get the support from the working to middle class, the people, the hardworking Australians that the left have forgotten. When you have left-wing politicians like the Labor continuing to go left to the Greens rather than supporting their working base, the working base starts to see, well, hold on a second, I can't vote for the Liberals because the Liberals to me are only for the upper class, they're only for the snobs. So. But I can't vote for Labor because the Labor, on their social policies or their political correctness, their freedom of speech attacks, they have gone too far. So what choice do I have? Their choice is with a party that they can relate to, that they, that they have uh, pride in who they are, that they don't attack their culture, that they believe in hardworking Australians, and that they continue to support their freedoms and don't go down the path of economic ruin. Okay, so I've just paused it there, so we'll just conclude the um, yeah, first segment. Yeah, that went really well, eh? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, just a bit of feedback, just... Um, uh, tr uh, make sure that you sort of don't deviate from the topic too much. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah, because um, uh, in in other parts of the show, like we're obviously going to be talking about, uh, you know, Marxism. So, sort mm. of, um, yeah, sort of sa save some of those sort of comments to that. That's the only sort of, um, yeah, feedback. Okay, yeah, that, that's cool. No worries. So uh, we'll talk about Castro now. So I'll just resume mm -hmm. um, this. Okay, so we'll move on to our next topic now, which is, I suppose you could call it good news, was the, the death of uh, Cuban dictator Fidel Castro, who, well, he ruled uh, Cuba ever since he came to power in the Cuban Revolution of 1959. He stepped down in 2008 uh, because of uh, ill health to uh, his brother, Raul Castro. And so, uh, obviously, the, uh, his uh, death, it's, uh, the reaction to it has, has been probably the, the main story with uh, uh, much of the media and world leaders actually praising him and talking about how wonderful he was. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, um, I, I have to laugh. I mean, um, of all days that he could have died, I mean, the irony of dying on Black Friday, which is the biggest day for capitalism, I mean, the, you, you just don't you don't get that anywhere, do you? I mean, and I, and like it was that. also <laughs> apparently uh, Augusto Pinochet's birthday as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good laugh, I mean, but this, this is something really, um, I mean, you're getting mixed reactions, of course. I mean... Obviously, you have to see it for what it is. He was a violent dictator. And I mean, during the Cuban Revolution, people fled from Cuba to America, to states like Florida and in the South. I mean, people fled during his reign. So 
there's many people that are now coming out, you know, all the social justice warriors, oh, how good he was and he did this for the people, but they didn't live there. They didn't experience what it was like. If people and families that experienced it, they knew what it was like and that is why they're the people that don't support it and they're celebrating his death now in the, in the streets of America. Yeah, I mean, we saw the uh, uh, streets of Miami, Florida, where uh, most of the Cuban American population lives and, I mean, they were, uh, you know, ju jubilant. I mean, they're peop they, they were people who'd actually lived there and so, you know, they knew how... How, how awful it was and so if, yeah if, if quite rightly they're they're celebrating that's exactly right i mean um and i mean this is a good example of um of, of somebody that you could trust with an opinion on marco rubio he was a uh, presidential candidate of course for the republican party now he's cuban origin so he knows what it was like there he he's his family came from there and he quoted saying, while you may want to open up to Cuba, there's no reason we should be opening up to Fidel Castro's legacy of anti-Americanism, of murder, of dictatorship, of imprisonment, of exile, which is what his legacy is all about. And of course, Trump came out strongly and also called him a brutal dictator who oppressed his own people who left a legacy of firing squads, theft, unimaginable suffering, poverty, and the denial of fundamental human rights. Yeah, I mean uh, that that was that was a really good, um, you know, a actual uh, story about <clears throat> about how life was like under under Fidel Castro. But you know, yeah. obviously, um, you know, we have and obviously Trump's uh, statement uh, re uh, uh, reaction to to Castro's death was was quite was quite good as well. But the the praising of uh, particular world leaders. I mean, we saw uh, Justin Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, uh, heap lavish praise on him. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the the UK leader of the Labour Party, uh, the EU president. I mean, it was really scary that you know these people in in such positions of power were willing to. Uh, we're willing to praise a murderous dictator. It, it really is scary. I mean, you're, you, you've got Barack Obama. He's the American president. And he comes out saying that Castro altered the course of individual lives, families, and of the Cuban nation. I mean, this, this is, you know, supposed to be someone that stands up and, and, and you know, basically says this guy caused so much havoc. I mean, the, the US and Cuba went at it for, for years, for decades. I mean, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s, that, that could have been nuclear war. Yeah. And then you get the president coming out now saying, oh, you know, this guy, you know, enriched the lives of, of the, the Cuban people. I mean, you've got, you know, others like Justin Trudeau, um, like you said, the Canadian PM, um, which, uh, according to some conspiracy theories, you got to laugh, um, could be the, the possible bastard son of the communist dictator himself, <laughs> um, yes, which is quite odd, quite odd. <laughs> it's, been, it's been quite the, the rumour on the internet the last few days. <laughs> they, you you, you got to laugh. I mean, they, they do look quite alike. I mean, definitely. But, I mean, he came out saying that he was a remarkable leader and a legendary revolutionary and orator. And Justin Trudeau, actually, he was going to attend the funeral um, of um, Fidel, and um, he's now backed away from that because he refused a huge backlash from the people on that because, I mean, why wouldn't you get a backlash for something like that? Of course, you're going to get Obama that's going to be there. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, of course, um, from the UK, he um, mentioned that he was going to attend the funeral. Um, so all of these uh, left-wing sort of um, followers um, that, that that have the, the, the communist manual on their bed tables um, at home, they're definitely going to be there. Um, but it just tells you a lot about these politicians that they praise or that they get behind such dictators like this. And, and all the myths that have been circulating the, the past few days that, oh, he introduced, you know, universal education and, and health care. Well, he did, but it was a, a poor quality. Oh. Uh, and yeah. Cuba has been impoverished for the past uh 
or 60, 60 years, I mean, uh, you, ha you have a look, uh, you know, the buildings are all very old and crummy, which for some reason the progressives, they actually like, well, they don't live there. I mean, you know, it's it hasn't got a high high standard of living. I mean, it, it's another example of of the failure of, of, of communism and central planning. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's exactly right. I mean, it's very easy for someone on the outside to look in and say how wonderful it is, but to experience it yourself is a different manner. I mean, they get free education, free health care, but how much tax were they paying? I mean, between you and me and many of our listeners, we know better than this. Nothing comes for free. I mean, this is just a scam. You know, these dictators purposely provide these... Um, these measures because this is basically um, a way of enslavement. It's control of the, of the populace, you know. So, I mean, nobody has individual freedoms there. Many people were killed and oppressed. Um, the, the, the gays in the country were, were, were slaughtered. Yeah, I mean, they, this they, is a thing. <laughs> they didn't have a good time. No, no, definitely not. And you, you still get these people coming out, you know, praising how good of a person he is. But these um, these people are supposed to be apparently looking after minority groups, right? So, I mean, it just really is, is a hypocrisy in itself. You've got the ABC at home continuing to praise how good he is and, uh, and whatnot. I mean... The, yeah, yeah. The, the ABC, I mean, uh, their coverage was probably the worst. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, our ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, one of their tweets was, uh, Cuba's uh, cigar-smoking uh, cigar romantic revolutionary. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, they're, they're just not trying to hide it anymore that, you know, they, they are communist. I mean, uh, who, who would, like, if, if you're... If your charter is to be balanced, uh, yeah. why why the hell would you send out a tweet which thinks that this dictator was, you know, a you know romantic and charismatic person? That, that's right, and I mean it doesn't stop only with our media organisations, but it really it's our politicians as well. I mean, we've got Lee Rhiannon, of course, you know, the the most communist person in the country. Um, she's praised him in the Senate. We've got Labor Party MPs in the House of Representatives that have come out and, um, you know, gave them condolences and, you know, um, basically, I mean, and anything that isn't a condemnation is basically um, a soft sort of support, you know. So they don't have to come out and say how wonderful he is, but by not saying how brutal he was, that's basically saying that they supported him. And the, the funny thing about this is that the Liberal government, the Liberal national government, when this was happening, the only thing they could do was have a laugh in the chamber. I mean, they they had a go at the Labor Party for, for doing these things to, 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 you know, saying how, how Castro was wonderful and they had a crack and, you know, said, oh, you know, they're your, that is your role model and everything, but they didn't condemn it. I mean, this government really should have put them in their place and condemn them for basically supporting such a dictator because I'm sure if any of the right was to come out and support a fascist dictator, I think it would be all over. I think it would be all over the news. You'd have politicians causing such havoc in the Senate, in the House of Reps. It would be everywhere. But the Liberal Party was soft. Instead of having a laugh about it, they should have stood up and actually condemned them for it. I mean, it's only really the the conservative media which has actually been, you know, t uh, telling the truth about, you know, what Castro's Cuba was 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 really like. I mean, the the misinformation out there that's been that's been put out there is really it's really quite scary, and it me and it certainly means that you know communism or socialism as an ideology has has not yet. Uh, been defeated. I mean, we still have, you know, communist uh, sympathisers in our um, uh, education systems and in our community groups. I mean, we talk a lot about uh, Ros Ward, the Marxist academic who designed the, the Safe Schools program, which has been rolled out in uh, schools nationally. I mean, if they're, if they're still able to pull off uh, a, feat, a feat like that in Australia, then certainly if, well, we still need to be vigilant. I mean, just because it, it was defeated once communism doesn't mean that it could ever return. 
Well, that, that's right. I mean, um, when when you mentioned Rose Ward, I mean, she would have been in tears right then when 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 her hero died. I mean, um, this is someone that wanted the red flag flown up on Parliament, and I mean, criticising Castro, I'm sure she would, you know, have a crack at me and say that, you know, it's my white privilege and that I have no place to criticise. But I mean, <laughs> this this is how they act. I mean. Every time that you raise legitimate points, all they do is basically point the finger and say, curse you, you're not allowed to say that, that's racist, it's bigotry, it's sexist, it's anything under the uh, under all names of the world. I mean, th- this is how they work. And like you said, it's been defeated once and with the rise of all the right-wing parties in Europe, in America, here in Australia, I think that it is a counter-revolution happening and I think it definitely can be defeated one more time. I mean, yeah, we've, we had a big victory with, with Trump uh, being elected, but it was also concerning the fact that, well, uh, Bernie Sanders, if the, if the prim- uh, Democratic primaries weren't rigged against him, he could have been the, the, the Democrat nominee for president who openly called himself mm-hmm. a socialist. That, that's right. I mean, um, the, the, this guy here was basically coming out and preaching to all of his, you know, university uh, students that they loved him because he was promising free degrees and free health care. But these people are young, un- just inexperienced, and they don't understand how society works. They, they're living in fantasy. When people are promising things that just cannot happen, I mean, if they really wanted to follow such a leadership or such a style as Bernie Sanders, maybe they would feel comfortable in Cuba, you know? I mean, these people have no idea because although it sounds good on paper, it never works in reality. I mean, they've, they're, they're lucky to be brought up in probably one of the, the most free and prosperous times in human history. I mean, they've got all the uh, advanced technologies, goods and services of capitalism, yet they seem to, you know, uh, spit on, uh, uh, you know, the, on what's been provided for them. That, that's right. I mean, it's just, it, it's just such um, a disrespect of, of what you have, what you've been raised with. I mean, these people don't know how lucky they have it. And for them to want to move um, politically into like a Cuba, like a North Korea, I mean, they really don't understand what they're getting themselves into because these freedoms that the left... Um, portray as, you know, supporting the minorities and, you know, people are going to be able to have everything for free. They're going to be able to do what they like without any rules and prohibitions or anything. This is fantasy because they use these lies to get them sucked in. And then as soon as they're in power, then they're going to be put under the farm. This is how they work. And these people are young people. I feel sorry for them because they don't know any better. They're raised in an education system that teaches them this and they haven't been taught any better. And this is why the system, our education system is so important because we're basically uh, educating people wrong and we're giving them false hopes and promises and they aren't getting taught how it actually runs. And this is really um, the false reality and um, why the left uh, are rubbing their hands because they know that from the young age that they're slowly bringing them up, that they're going to be having more people that are going to vote for them, more people supporting their ideals because they're taught at such an age that they don't know any better and they're not taught alternatives, which is why there's the news media. What we're doing is so critical and important that we are continuing to press other ideas that the other media, the mainstream media, isn't covering. This is so important because people will get to see, oh, I didn't actually notice that on the news tonight. I didn't see that or hear of that. And it gets people thinking. This is about making people think, not getting told what to believe, but actually thinking yourself and creating your own your own belief system based on what you believe rather than what you are told to believe. Yeah. 
Okay, so for our third topic, we will move back home to Australia, where the left uh, uh, are doing their best to to try and uh, destroy or the uh, Australian life and culture that was um, uh, that was on on display this week, where uh, uh, the city of Fremantle Council in Western Australia decided they would move Australia Day uh, two days later, from January twenty sixth uh, to January twenty eighth and call it one day because they believe that Australia Day is not inclusive. I mean, they subscribe to this whole um, Invasion Day uh, mindset, which... which uh, which basically, which believes that Australia Day was the, you know, the beginning of a of a horrible historical event. Which I mean, if you have that point of view, then you're basically denying that uh, modern Australia has has any legitimacy, and that we should basically just all leave. It, it is a denial of history, isn't it? I mean, we we have people that are trying to rewrite history as we speak. We all know, we all been taught how it happened. Um, what the circumstances was, terra nullius, it was all there. Now, these people are trying to rewrite history. Now, the mayor has come out and he's quoted saying, everyone should celebrate when they feel it is appropriate. However, the city of Fremantle wanted to celebrate being Australian in a way that included all Australians, and we believe moving away from this date was more culturally inclusive and more in line with Fremantle's values. And he's not only said that, but he said... Australia Day might not have the same implication for all Australians and the city wanted a more inclusive celebration. And and a big laugh about this is that he's actually come out, um, this is the Fremantle Mayor, Brad Petit. He's actually denied that the council was trying to be politically correct. I, I mean, that's what, that's what they they, they <laughs> always say. I mean, because um, they because they know that the term uh, politically correct is toxic, but they just say, mm. oh, you know, it's it, it, you know, we're not you know adhering to some you know to- totalitarian uh, of uh, ideology. We're, we're we're just trying to be inclusive. I mean, that's the language they always use. That that that's. Just like you say, I mean, um, he's also come out and said this is just offering another alternative event that celebrates the diversity of Australians and one that I know Aboriginal people in Fremantle are more comfortable with. But the funny thing is, an Aboriginal elder, Robert Isaacs, has attacked the decision to cancel Australia Day celebrations. He's come out and Dr Isaacs is a former head of the Australia Day Council and he suggested that it's a silly idea and that the council is out of step with the majority of the community. He also says that people, the council, should not be playing around with white politics and black politics, that it's not the spirit of Australia and that we should not just listen to a small group of people and change it from the 26th to the 28th. It doesn't stand up with me, he says, and it doesn't stand up with the community. It's a celebration, a community together. It brings the people together and celebrates the good of this country that it has provided for everyone. I mean, if you have an Aboriginal elder coming out to say this, it really shows where it's coming from. It isn't the minority groups that are attacking it. It's the, the left that continue to play politics, identity politics with these issues and try, this is just an aim to divide communities by class, gender, race, religion. Instead of uniting people to be Australian, they want minority groups because this is how they exploit people and exploit groups for their advantage. Yeah, I mean, last time I checked, uh, you know, anybody of any race could could celebrate Australia Day. Uh, f- mm. No, I mean, yeah, this is just, you know, basically, as you said, the left. I mean, you know, they, you know, they hate, uh, you know, Western society in general, and so uh, attacking Australia Day is 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 a pr- is a pretty uh, pretty basic proposition for them. I mean, yes, like. Obviously, yes, there were, you know, injustices done to, you know, Aboriginal people uh, in the past. That's not denied. But over, but over time, we've uh, Australia's done its best to correct those. And Aboriginal Australians, they are equal with uh, with other other Australian citizens. And you'd have to say that overall, today, you know, Aboriginal people do in uh, are are better are better for the fact that you know European settlement did happen. 
they are definitely better off than they used to be. I mean, Western civilization came here and made this country what it is today. I mean, this is such a great country and we should be celebrating what we have created. I mean, we have people that have been here for generations. We have people that have um, come in and immigrated and accepted our way of life and that continue to love this country because it's provided so much for them. I mean, um, for anyone to come out and um, what I would suggest is uh, biting the hand that feeds them. I mean, this is just such a disrespect and very similar to the other case of, um, for instance, um, what we mentioned in the in the past topic of um, someone um, promoting communism without living in that sort of country. It's very easy to attack Western values, but what's the alternative to Western values? I mean, where is it that these people, what's their ideal thought? What What is it that they want? And um, it's very obvious what they want, but is it really going to better their life? Is it really going to make them happy, um, I don't think it will, you know, uh, it really is false hope and um, it, it's an attack of um, just a, a big negativity that they bring. I mean, if anything goes wrong in life, instead of fixing their life themselves and bettering themselves, we just have to change society and just, you know, uh, turn it 180 degrees and it's sort of like a, um, I'm having a tough time so screw everybody else kind of attitude. Yeah, and uh, we were also fortunate this week that we did actually have somebody, you know, defend, uh, you know, Australia uh, and, and its culture. We had the immigration minister Peter Dutton, which was it was not last Thursday, but the Thursday before, <clears throat> um, talk about how. Uh, Malcolm Fraser, the Prime Minister in the, the 1970s, had made mistakes by letting in uh, a large number of Lebanese Muslims who, ha who have contributed to terrorist plots in Australia and are involved in organised crimes. And, of course, the, this is uh, unspeak of stuff you're not supposed to to say uh, in the in the eyes of the left and so he was hounded about it uh, all, all week uh, there were calls for him to be sacked but um, uh, thankfully he he's he stuck by st stuck by his guns and you know uh, said that you know I want to you know make sure that we don't repeat the the immigration mistakes of the of the past. Peter Dutton really uh, brought an issue to light here. He was stating facts. I mean, he comes out and just like any proper immigration minister would, he states the facts, what the problems are and how we can fix these mistakes. I mean, the Fraser government in the 70s did go through a time where they let so many people into the country and it wasn't like the old days. See, I mean, my parents came to this country uh, in the 60s and the 70s. Um, definitely um, the, the European post-World War II uh, migrants. But they came here for a better life and they worked hard to get it. Now, these people, when they came to this country, they lived in garages, you know, um, and usually had to pay somebody rent. It was a garage that was situated at, at, at the back of a house or, or something like a shed, you know, not, not really the perfect living standards. But they didn't complain one bit. They worked hard and now they own all of the small businesses. They, they own, you know, um, great corporations even. They have made such a life with the opportunity that Australia has provided, we need to promote integration rather than segregation. This is the this is the thing. And I mean, with the, the Lebanese Muslim uh, immigrants, there are many that have done so well for this country. There is no denying that. And Peter Dutton actually said that, you know, but the fact is that the left have to pick and choose what to quote, see? Now, there is no denying that the Lebanese Muslim uh, community have caused the most amount of uh, activities or crimes, as you will. Um, now, there was um, a quote that Peter Dutton, um, a, a factual uh, percentage, and it was in the 60 percentage range of uh, crimes that has been committed. Now, that this is huge for one community to be behind this many crimes. Now, this is stating facts, but then you have a green, oh, Nick yes. McKim come out, Nick McKim, he comes out and says, you know what, it may be facts, but the facts aren't important, you know, because the facts um, the are feelings, right? 
Yeah, the triggering, because apparently feelings are more important than facts. Now, how can you, as a politician, come out and say that facts aren't important? I mean, Peter Dunnan only stated facts, and he didn't criticise the whole community, but was saying that there were issues in that community that needed to be fixed, that there was big percentages of crimes committed by that community. But like I had mentioned, migrants that have come here worked hard, that they have succeeded, these people are really good and benefit benefits to the country. But not everybody is like that. And when you have a welfare system that's out of control, people refusing to work, people that all they can do is continue to complain and to um, basically um, feel that they're victimised, even though this country has provided so much for them. Because if they were back where they came from originally, they wouldn't have what they had here. And this is such a disrespect that these people have, what they've been given, and they don't appreciate what they've been given. I mean, the the excuse the left come up with is that, oh, well, these Lebanese Muslims, they only uh, engage in these activities because we're so racist. Well, how come, Mm. uh, you know, obviously... You know uh, the Greeks and Italians. They were they were never involved in you know terrorist activities. Neither have the you know Vietnamese and Chinese, which you mm. know basically shows that you know there's something in that culture and dare I say it in their in their religion, which is which is mm. causing causing these problems. Yeah, I, I see it exactly like this. I mean, um, now people. In that community, um, there are many that are successful that are business owners that have uh, integrated. Um, But when you have um, a large portion, um, and you could call it a minority, fair enough, but it's still a large, quite a large quantity of a minority, um, still committing crimes and um, continuing to uh, segregate themselves from everybody else, um, you start to question. And I mean... If these people really didn't want to be victimised, if they really wanted everyone to accept them, then they wouldn't be doing what they are doing because by doing what they do, they are further making people dislike them. I mean, they are making people think, well, you know, this is who they are. So if they really wanted people to appreciate what they uh, what they can achieve and, um, and everything, they'd have to fit in. They have to assimilate into the culture. And they still can have... Um, their own um, multicultural, um, they can still eat their own food, they can go and do their own, they can do whatever they like, but they shouldn't have to be in a position where they push their views on everybody else. And that is where people uh, get to a stage where they uh, get very frustrated. And of course, the the uh, the final part of our uh, topic about uh, Australian uh, culture or the war on it is, of course, we discovered that there is a a new anti racism program in our education system, which is aimed at preschoolers. So they're getting younger and younger, <laughs> which is called the the Building Belonging Program, an anti racism program uh, by the Australian Human Rights Commission, which we've talked about how uh, oh, well, anti-human rights that they, they actually are, where, which uh, which it basically uh, you know t- uh, takes takes this perspective that you know children or oh, white children they're they're automatically you know racist for a, from a young age and and uh, they pick up all, all this racism from their parents and so you know teaches them you know f- uh, not uh, f- not to, uh, f- you know not to be racist and it, it really sort of has this effect of actually you know creating because you know children already go to schools with uh you know children from many different races i mean you know they've you know they see them every day i mean i think this this program is likely to create a a difference uh, between students where they where they need not be yeah i mean this is just another um, another add-on program of uh, the safe schools and also um, respectful relationships, and um, of course um, the way they promote it is love and harmony, which is um, this this is the thing. I mean, when you um, promote such a um, such a program and you say it's about love, diversity, 
it, it puts you in a very tough place because it's very hard to criticize that because then they will point the finger at you and say, well, how can you be against love? How can you be yeah. against harmony? It, 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 it's very difficult to be able to, um, to criticize it. And this is political correctness gone mad, of course. It's really what it's trying to do is... Uh, um, create some sort of, just like the Respectful Relationships Program, some sort of privilege that isn't there because in this country, everybody has the same opportunities. I mean, we're not talking about, say, um, somebody that was born here and someone that was born in Ethiopia. We're all in Australia here. I mean, everybody has the exact same opportunity. I saw a very, very good photo um, today on Facebook, on social media that I have to mention. And um, it showed three black men. Um, this was based in America. And um, one was in, um, this was held in a courtroom. One was a police officer, one was a lawyer, and one was a criminal in handcuffs. And basically what it said was, these people had all the same opportunities and they had, it had nothing to do with the color of their skin, but they chose, it was their choice what they chose, what life to leave. And this can be basically um, an example that we could use here in Australia. I mean, everyone, no matter what colour of the skin you are, has the same opportunity to succeed. And by creating this false sense of privilege, it really, um, what it does is it puts down that white kid. I mean, that person's going to grow up thinking, hold on a second, I'm somehow better off than that person, so that person has to receive um, a better treatment, you know? I mean, so what it's going to do is it's going to basically turn everything upside down and it's going to then put white people um, at a disadvantage. So it doesn't really preach equality. It, um, it really um, messes society up. And by promoting it to young people, I mean, it's heartbreaking because they don't know any better, you know. I mean, parents are sending kids to school to learn maths, English, you know, to actually get an education, and yet they are getting taught this, you know. I mean, par parents are going to be feeling like they're ripped off because they aren't the ones teaching kids basic ethics, which is what their job is. It's not a school, it's not the, the position of the state to teach uh, ethics or, um, or, or anything like that to, to children in school. They're there for education purposes and all these brainwashing programs, um, it's very scary. It, it really is extreme and I think uh, it has shown how extreme it is because there's many communities that have come out the Chinese community in Sydney have come out and gotten tens of thousands of signatures about this sort of thing. I mean, this is huge. And people are starting to know what's going on. And it, it's very sad that it's come to this, that we've let it go this far. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've uh, uh, first we had, you know, obviously straight privilege, and then we had male privilege, and now mm -hmm. they've got they've gone for the trifecta with a program about white privilege. Now, yeah. um, yeah. before we uh, finish up, uh, no uh, unshackled waves uh, episode would be complete without a a, a comment on the uh, the Trump uh, transition. We thought we'd do a brief brief summary of that. Yeah. Um, now, in, in regards to the Trump transition, I mean, um, we, we've had great um, people appointed already. Um, already Trump has appointed Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions as an attorney general. Big choice. Kansas Republican Mike Pompeo for CIA director. And a strange and odd choice, actually. Um, South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley has been appointed ambassador to the UN. Now, Nikki Haley was someone very critical of Trump, but yeah. it has shown that he's mending bridges here. So he is trying to um, mend the rifts that are in the Republican Party by choosing different people. Not yeah. only that, he's, he's picked a good national security advisor in Mike Flynn, good supporter of his. And uh, another person to note is uh, Betsy DeVos. Now, Betsy DeVos um, is just proof of how um, diverse his cabinet is. He's got both DeVos and Haley, both women in his cabinet. Haley is a daughter of an Indian immigrant. Um, to the United States. He's got Ben Carson, which is going to get a big role. 
Um, he's the retired neurosurgeon um, African American that ran for um, for uh, president. Um, so he's got good people around him. And one thing that I really need to to raise is um, the si- the situation of Secretary of State. Now there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, gossip um, that Mitt, uh, Mitt Romney might be chosen as Secretary uh, Secretary of State, right? and um, this this would be such a bad choice or decision because this is someone that had came, come out of Trump and called him a fake, a fraud, a con man, phony, dangerous. I mean, it would be. I understand that Trump needs to build bridges. I understand yeah. that he has to mend. Um, but Romney is one of the biggest critics um, of Trump. I mean, he, he really hammered him hard. And, I mean, it is fine to um, to have people that were critical of you in Cabinet, for sure, but Romney wouldn't be a choice for that, definitely wouldn't. Um, and I think the, the Trump supporters, the base, would be really um, outraged at such, a, such an option. Instead, there is good options out there like um, New York, uh, ex-New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, a very good choice, very good Trump supporter, and uh, very strong choice, experienced. And obviously Newt Gingrich as well is also a good person um, that if he's in, um, in, in that role contention could get something else that uh, is at a, a high position. Um, but it is um, it, it would be outrageous to suggest uh, Mitt Romney to, to get such a post. I think um, there would be a big outcry in the community. Yeah, I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, stories in the newspaper. I mean, I believe that Romney has now had two two meetings with, with Trump. Um, yeah, mm. and I definitely agree that I think uh, pointing Romney would be uh, mending a bridge too far. Uh, mm. No, I've... Uh, I, be, uh, I actually have uh, a, th- a theory that, oh, well, this is what I'm hoping, that, that Trump is actually just wasting Romney's time. He's stringing him along to, like, make him think he's in the ru- uh, the running, and then at the end he'll just say, ha, fooled you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's what I hope he's well, doing. It's quite possible because, I mean, Trump is a very smart man. He's not somebody that would easily let someone step over him and then buckle down for him. He he really um, he isn't where he is for for nothing. I mean, he's very smart and he doesn't forget. He definitely doesn't forget how Romney treated him. I mean, Trump came out when Romney was president. He supported him, was loyal to him, uh, endorsed him, and then for Mitt Romney to come out strongly. I mean, Mitt Romney wasn't even a candidate for president. I mean, he could have been in the background if he didn't support Trump. He could have been in the background and said not a word, but he came out and hammered him hard. I mean, you know, saying he was a fraud, you know, saying such negative things about him, which could have really damaged his uh, prospects in the election. And for for Trump to then promote someone like this um, wouldn't really make much sense. And I don't think, to be honest, Romney is a talent that would be, um, uh, that would be such... Um, a, a good choice for the job anyway, regardless of whether he was loyal or not. I think uh, I think Romney's very overrated, to be honest. Um, but um, hopefully he does make a good choice in, in that decision. Yes. Well, there's still a, still a lot to be determined in this area, so no doubt mm. we'll, we'll do another report on the, the Trump transition in a, mm. in a future episode. But uh, that's all we've uh, got time for on today's show. But before uh, we wrap up, uh, uh, we've got some important uh, news. Uh, uh, there is a new uh, Facebook page, which uh, I would like to encourage you to all like and check out on a regular regular basis, that is uh, War on the Left. Uh, Damien is actually one of the the admins for it, so I might let him explain uh, what it's all about. Okay, well, basically War on the Left, um, it, it's a page that's designed for everybody that uh, despises, that um, is just sick of the, the continual push that the left have on our society. So um, we put constant... Um, videos um, on there. We, we put um, articles that we share um, to, just to, to basically um, continue to get that new media like we talked about earlier and promote that, um, that alternative opinion that isn't uh, put in the mainstream. So um, we would uh, love people to, to join the group and, um, and to like the page, uh, War on the Left. 
uh, we will continue to work um, with War on the Left to um, to promote our cause and um, to ensure that uh, we get economic sustainability, that we uh, get freedoms uh, back into our uh, society, um, values, principles, and 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 basically a, a strong country once again. And I will continue also to uh, provide um, articles for um, the Unshackled as we continue to rise. Um, now with our, um, our our great showing in um, in um, the Fairfax media. So um, it would be great to uh, continue to uh, provide for them and to continue to raise our numbers and, and get people on board. Yes, we're we're certainly encouraged by the past week to 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 keep on keep on going and and uh, uh, try and uh, f- uh, further our reach. Uh, so so thank you, Damien, so much for for being uh, my first uh, guest co-host for our review show. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and uh, thanks so much, Tim, of course, for uh, providing this podcast and. Um, th- Hopefully, we get a lot of people on board to support our cause and continue to um, to to win in um, in Parliament, in society in general, and um, to enrich the minds and um, continue to, um, to to make sure that we uh, can just continue to get a, a good, positive outlook for our future. Yep. Uh, definitely. So that's it. That's it for us today. And so we'll see you uh, next episode.